Jessica Gagem. I would shed light on the fact that there is a lack of compassion and that there is a stigma surrounding women's health care. And I was just very real and very authentic. I wasn't trying to be anybody else. And I think that's possibly why the judges liked me in the end and why I placed so high. Mm -hmm. You had over 100 people representing their own country there. Mm -hmm. And you were among the most high achieving women. And mm -hmm. still you felt like you didn't fit in. So I'd never felt like I was in competition with anyone anyway. And I don't mean that in some kind of arrogant mm -hmm. way. I mean... Jessica Gagin. <laughs> Hi. I feel I feel like I had to start it that way because last time when we recorded, which was exactly a year ago, I started with Jessica Gagin, Miss England. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's Jessica Gagin, Miss, Miss United World. Kingdom. Oh, and oh, Miss, Miss World, World finalist. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. Tell me about everything. Okay, maybe to start with, let's set the scene for people listening to us for the first time, mm -hmm. or rather listening to you for the first time. Mm -hmm. Who's Jessica Gagin? So my name is Jessica Gagin. I am a graduate of Aerospace Engineering. I won the Miss England contest in 2022 and I use my platforms to get more girls interested in STEM, the different pathways STEM can lead to and essentially empower women. And I've then gone on through the Miss World contest to win Miss World Europe. And because I placed highest out of the UK contenders, I'm now Miss United Kingdom. So it's been a bit of a journey. It has been a bit of a journey. And I should say, you're the first guest who I've sort of had to bring back on and be like, let's reflect on this past year. Oh, amazing. I feel complimented. <laughs> I really hope like I bring on more guests because I feel like when I started, I was at the very beginning of experimenting the podcast. And I should say the last time we recorded, we were actually in my living room. We were. And what was really fun is that we met, we recorded for an hour-ish. I had to keep on checking the camera. And then after we were done recording, I don't know if you remember, we spent about two hours over two cups of tea in my kitchen talking about life. <laughs> we did, we did. It was like a three hour podcast with only one hour that was recorded. It was and I felt bad because I didn't realise you were going out with your sister but your sister was part of the chat as she well. She was part of the chat <laughs> and I think we talked about what you want to do after Miss World and we were talking about jewellery and shopping and everything else, girly stuff. Yeah. <laughs> How has life been? It's been good, yeah. I've met so many incredible people this year and I think that's been my highlight of being Miss England. It's the people that I've I've met the amount of inspiring stories I've heard which have empowered me as mm -hmm. well and they've taught me lessons I've made many friendships and that's the thing I'm most grateful for this year that's amazing and I think when I was watching your journey so when I met you last year and you did say I didn't know what's in store for me when I go to Miss World and then I remember saying to my sister I think Jess I should say my twin another Jess <laughs> also, I call her Jesse but I said to Jesse like I think Jess is going to place really nicely because obviously I could see that you were very confident you had a great passion and you wanted to talk about your STEM journey and so on. And then when I was watching your journey, obviously you were placing highly in sports and other fields. Mm -hmm. How was the competition for you going, f when you were going through the competition, obviously you went in with some level of confidence, right? Mm -hmm. And then you go there, you met with so many high achieving women. Mm -hmm. Did you feel at some point that your confidence was a bit lower on some other days? Or did you feel somewhat very confident, very determined for that? And honest, honest, honest chat. Like if you felt that way, please by all means, please say. <laughs> um, yes and no. So okay. honestly, the day that I got here, got there, I should say, I felt, oh my gosh, I'm in the deep end. I, I'm i in too deep. Like, oh my gosh, I don't fit in because I'd landed the day before we were meant to get there. So there was maybe like 10 girls who were at our hotel at that point. And I was straight off a flight, which I'd flown to Helsinki and then to Delhi. So, and I'd not slept. So I was really, really tired and I'd made myself look nice for the airport. Now, usually I'm in an airport in something really, really comfortable <laughs> because obviously fly in. But when you go into Miss World, you need you to be looking to be. very put together because you don't know who's going to be taking pictures on your arrival. So I was in this gorgeous white drum suit and some black court heels. And then when I arrived, I went straight to breakfast and the girls who were already there looked like they were going to Ascot. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my gosh, I'm in too deep here. Oh my gosh, I just don't feel like I fit in. And at that moment, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to up my game. Like, how can I compete? These women are just gorgeous. They're all so friendly. They're so mm-hmm. talented at everything they do. But for me, first and foremost, I felt intimidated just from the outfit aspect. Okay. I was like, oh my gosh, how can I keep up? But then the way I go about moments like that, I thought, you know what? Focus on what I can control mm-hmm. rather than what I can't control. Rather than comparing myself from the get-go. Because I don't know, they might be comparing themselves to me. You, you don't know. And so I thought, right, let's not focus on the fact that I'm not wearing some kind of couture piece every single day. Mm-hmm. Let's enjoy the moment and be present in the competition and just be real and authentic. And I always used to say, I'm here to be myself, nobody else. And so throughout the rest of the competition, I didn't feel any less confident because I thought, I'm just here to be me. Mm-hmm. I'm not here to be anybody else. Yes, I'm representing England. I'm here to make friends for life. I'm going to have a friend in every country after this. I've always got a connection and I just need to immerse myself in the moment. So any confidence issues went. I think it was just that first day seeing all these gorgeous stunning outfits I mean one of the girls had a fascinator on and I thought oh my gosh I haven't even brought a fascinator (laughs) Um, but yeah I thought snap out of it go and have a nap which I did and then after that was fine (laughs) oh that's great I think what's interesting is that you say you didn't fit in or you felt at first that you didn't fit in and I sometimes find it so sad that I I don't know if you've watched the movie Barbie and maybe we're digressing here but there was this scene where I think Gloria had this amazing powerful speech where she goes goes on about that women as a woman were never enough. It is literally impossible to be a woman. You are so beautiful and so smart and it kills me that you don't think you're good enough. You were the Miss England representing the country Mm -hmm. and you were there among maybe over 100 and what was it? We have over 190 countries but maybe not all of them placed at Miss World, I don't know. But you had over 100 people representing their own country there. Mm -hmm. And you were among the most high achieving women and Mm -hmm. still you felt like you didn't fit in. Yeah, honestly, it was because from the get go, I think I'd been looking forward to that moment for like over a year and I didn't Mm. know what to expect. You know, it's hard to kind of train for these things. And so I knew that eyes would be on us all the time. Like from the moment I stepped off the plane, I had to just be alert all the time, you know, sitting up straight, like (laughs) no slouching and stuff. And yeah, so as soon as I saw fascinators on the first day, I thought, oh my gosh, how am I going to compete with this every single day? But then as obviously time goes on, you realise the girls aren't wearing fascinators every single day. Right. Um, some of them have multiple outfit changes every day. Um, I had some, but for the most part, I used to just try and stay in the same clothes. It was only if I had to get changed, I did. Mm-hmm. And I was just very real and very authentic. I wasn't trying to be anybody else. And I think that's possibly why the judges liked me in the end and why I placed so high, mm-hmm. because I wasn't trying to be anybody else. I was so real. And even even when we had our interviews, I think a lot of the girls might have used their interviews to kind of like pitch what they were about. But in my head, I thought everybody knows I'm the science and maths girl here. Like I've made that known for the past year. Right. The judges have that written in front of them. So I'm going to tell them a story about the time I got stuck up a mountain dressed like a lion. And I did. And I thought I could have put nails in the coffin there. Like maybe <laughs> I've written myself off before the contest. But I didn't because obviously I still placed high. Okay. So I'm kind of curious because I think Lisa is uh, Miss Mauritius. Mm-hmm. Turns out you and her are really good friends. Yeah. And I'll hopefully be recording with her as well. And she said hello. <laughs> She's amazing. She actually said she also had that interview. And I, f- I think from her stories, I remember her saying, oh, she didn't feel, oh, oh, I don't want to speak on her behalf. But I remember seeing on her stories where she, she felt like before the interview, she hadn't placed as high as she wanted. And then when she came out of her interviews, I think she posted a story saying, I've done the best that I could. And you also talking about the same interview that happens behind closed doors. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell us more about this? What was so you mentioned the story about you being stuck <laughs> high up in the mountain? What did you actually tell the judges? What get asked? I guess the question is, what gets asked of you that we don't get to see? So this this one day when you're told, okay, it's interview day, or for us, we found out the evening before. Okay. And then the way they did it this year with the contest, I can't speak for all years, but this year we were divided into continents. So it'd be like, okay, Africa goes first, and then we'll have Americas, and then Europe, mm. or whatever the order was I can't remember yeah we got called during our times to go and interview and I didn't know whether it was going 
going to be a set of questions or whether it was all we were all going to get the same question I wasn't sure and we got taken up in groups of three so I went in with Finland and Estonia because it was alphabetical and they just said tell us a little bit about yourself and that was it and we had a few minutes maybe like 90 seconds two minutes max because Mm -hmm. there's so many girls to get through and there was like a panel of judges there just listening to us Okay. and so yeah I started off and I said hello my name is Jessica Gagin and represented England I did go briefly into my story because there was people there who mightn't have heard the story there's people there who definitely would have known Mm -hmm. the story Mm -hmm. so I said you know I'm all about empowering women in STEM I like to empower children as well I talk about my own failures in order to boost their confidence to make it known that you know sometimes your path isn't straight and I'm all about getting more women into engineering and showing them what they can be with a STEM career Mm -hmm. but Aside from that, I'm going to tell you something which might make me memorable. And it's the time I got stuck up a mountain dressed like a lion. (laughs) And all of the panel were laughing. And I thought, well, at least I'm memorable. It Mm -hmm. mightn't have been what they were expecting. In fact, probably definitely wasn't. (laughs) (laughs) But it was something which I thought, you know what? It might be a risk that pays off. It might not be. But if anything, it shows my personality. And I think that's so important for them to get to know me. Because I'm going to be working with that team for the next year. Mm -hmm. And that was what I wanted to get across, you know. Yes, I can be this science and technical girl and, you know, be everything you want me to be on screen. But behind the scenes, am I friendly to work with? And I wanted to get that across. So that was my take on it. And that did it. (laughs) Yeah. Can can we talk about the moment where you were actually on stage for Mm -hmm. the finals then? Mm -hmm. What were you feeling? Did you feel confident? Did you... Did you have an instinct that this is going well? Honestly, to me, it's almost like a blur. It goes by so fast. Okay. And there's so many girls there, so it is really hard to call it. There's Mm -hmm. certain girls who you think, okay, that girl stands out because of this, because of that. And bear in mind, we're there for three weeks competing where we have loads of different rounds where you get to know the girls. So it's not necessarily about winning rounds but through the rounds you can gain exposure so I didn't win sportswoman although I was part of the winning sports team right and so during that time all eyes were on the sports team during the sports days and during the bleep test and then you know through interviews and different things like that so there's lots of different ways to become memorable and then when it gets to the end final you've got to know the girls on such a personal level as well and primarily team Europe who I was a part of Mm -hmm. I knew those girls the Best. So when it came to picking out a select few, I, I just couldn't <laughs> because they were all so amazing. I was right. like, how do they decide on this? I just don't understand what goes into it. It must be such a hard job and I'm glad I'm not a judge. <laughs> but yeah, I remember on the day before going out, I'm not going to lie, I felt kind of a bit not so much apprehensive because I was looking forward to it but again like out of my depth because straight away we started the evening with a performance and typically I'm not a performer I don't Mm -hmm. mind getting up on stage and speaking in front of people I don't mind presenting but being in front of a big audience and receiving applause has never been my thing and why and so yeah to be on stage like dancing and twirling about and having everybody watch you I was thinking this feels a bit weird (laughs) but it was really really fun Um, and then yeah it just kind of flashed by you know suddenly you know you're called out for top 40 and I knew I was in the top 40 because I'd won the public speaking round so Mm -hmm. that was kind of like which is an amazing speech by the way I've watched it (laughs) thank you and then after that public speaking round it was like right well it's anyone's game now I've got no idea I'm Mm -hmm. in the position that all the other girls were in not knowing if they were going forward and then I was called for top 12 and I was like oh my gosh this is amazing and then top eight and then I get a question and I was like oh my gosh Mm -hmm. how have I made it this far because there was 112 girls in it so it was more like a shock than anything I had no expectations whatsoever Yeah, and I think that's the best way. Did you feel like when you got to, when you were told you were part of top 40 and it sounded like you knew you were because based Mm -hmm. on the rankings of some of the previous achievements, did you tell yourself that I'm going to be happy being part of top top 40 and anything post that is just going to be an extra surprise? For me, Or did you still have hope like, let's wait, I I hope to be among the top 12? Oh, I wanted to place high. I really did. Like I go into things to win them. (laughs) But Mm. I also knew the competition I was up against. Mm. And I also knew that there's so many things it's judged on, which 
you might know about like I'm not not a judge I don't know the exact criteria of the girls they were looking for because the girls who've ended up winning the continental titles myself being one of them were all so different and amazing in different ways Mm -hmm. like these girls are just incredible they're role models they're so inspirational and they inspire me and I'm thinking why do I fit in with this lot (laughs) you know they're so fantastic yeah you we just, always compare ourselves to the to the other person, right? Just, yeah. And I'm sure that like, there will be so many people who would have been like, I wish I could speak as confidently as Jess. Oh. It's always a comparison game, isn't it? It really is, yeah. So moving forward, yeah, I wanted to place as high as I possibly could. But I always used to just say to my parents, like, I want to get to the end where I can speak on stage and have a question. And then I'll try my best. And then if it's good enough, it's good enough. If it's not, I just want to be satisfied with what I've said. Mm -hmm. And when I walk to the end of the stage to have that question, oh my gosh, I bottled it. You can't tell (laughs) on the video. You can't tell on the video. (laughs) But I can I can see in myself, like, whilst I was speaking to begin with, you don't get much thinking time at all you can see I'm speaking very slowly because I'm trying to think Think of what to say and then after that I was straight into it and it was very short and sweet and I said what I said and then after that I went out and I was then overthinking it thinking Mm, oh gosh I wish I had said this maybe I should have said this maybe I should have said that but you don't get that time to prepare you don't know what question you're going to get and then when I sat down all the girls from Europe were like you were amazing that was a a fantastic answer that was incredible and so after the contest happened the first thing I did was hop onto YouTube and 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 find myself and I was on the bus next to Wales listening to myself thinking what do I think of this and I listened and I went to Wales oh my gosh I actually smashed that question I'm quite happy with that Mm -hmm. (laughs) so after then I felt completely fine because I thought you know what I've, I've done what I set out to do I got to the point where I got to answer a question I've managed to use this platform to do everything I want to do with it and I'm satisfied with what I said so we're always more Mm self-critical than other people are of us Mm -hmm. and I do feel like it's interesting to hear you talk about your experience about how you answered the question and wanting to jump on to YouTube to actually hear what you said yeah because in the moment you said what you had to what you felt like Mm -hmm. and then sometimes like you question it so much you're more self-critical than anything else yeah what was the post Miss World coming to reality like for you? Well, it was a bit crazy for a while because as soon as we finished the contest, I think we must have got to the hotel. It was gone midnight. Mm -hmm. and when we got to the hotel they then sashed the continental winners so they called us all up and then gave us our sashes and then I hadn't looked at my phone but I had a text to say you need to come to the boardroom ASAP and then so my chaperone I should mention every group has a chaperone okay um and then there's so much security around you you're completely safe at all times Um, but my chaperone found me and she said Jess have you checked your phone and I was like oh no do not disturb son (laughs) (laughs) and um it automatically comes on I've got it set so um, I said oh no sorry do not disturb son and she said you need to go to the boardroom and I was like oh right okay so I walked into the boardroom and they said oh you're going to Mauritius tomorrow yay and I was like oh (laughs) That's fine by me. And I said, um, do you want me to just pack one case of the specific things you need me to pack? What time are we going? And they said, oh, we've not booked the flight jet, but it's probably going to be afternoon, evening tomorrow. Um, and just pack all of your stuff. Bring it all with you. You'll be going back to England from Mauritius. And I was like, oh, well, that's... Some sunshine before. That's a nice little bonus. <laughs> because we were pre-warned that some of the girls might be kept on, but we didn't realise where. I assumed we would still be in India. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the next day I was flown to Mauritius. I was meant to be on the same flight back to London with my mum and my dad yeah. um, so I was like see you later <laughs> when, I saw, when I saw that you guys were all going to Mauritius I was super excited I think it's I love I love Mauritius obviously proud yeah. Mauritius but it's such a small island and Miss World had been such a big event and I normally don't follow it but I did follow it this time because of you and because I was following you and Lisa and mm-hmm. I, it felt nice knowing that oh like to, just to see your journey and then when I saw that you guys were going to Mauritius I was so excited and I was watching all your stories I'm like I'm so jealous that you're <laughs> Because you had such like sunny pictures, but equally deep down, I was, I was so happy that you get to experience the country and that we had talked about it last year. And I was like, oh, to see you guys there, I was like, oh, I'm so glad for you. Oh, it was amazing. It was lovely that Lisa, Lisa was going as well because she wasn't one of the continental winners. So we didn't, I didn't even put two and two together. And mm-hmm. then it was only that day I messaged her and I said, hey, we're going to Mauritius. We, we might be on the same flight because typically all the girls depart 
over the next mm-hmm. day, two mm-hmm. days. Everybody's as soon as the contest's done, everybody flies off. And so I said, hey, we might actually be on the same plane. Mm-hmm. And we were talking for a bit. And she said, I don't actually know if I'm going to be with you or not. And turns out she was with us for the whole week we were in Mauritius, mm-hmm. which was lovely because, as I was saying before, off air, she was teaching me little bits of French words. Come on, say, come on, tell us the French word, <laughs> which I thought was very niche. I didn't want to hear it from you on air. Coccinelle. <laughs> For non-French speakers, that's ladybug. <laughs> Which I think is a very niche word. I didn't have to, but I was just asking like the girls, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? And it was Miss Martinique who said, oh, can you pronounce this? Yeah. And I was like, oh, and I tried to pronounce it, pronounced it wrong. And they corrected me and then it just stuck. I just couldn't stop saying coccinelle. <laughs> it it's, just a kept, cute, it's a cute word. It kept coming into my head. So yeah, it was great to have Lisa there with us mm. as well because I'd actually previously been to Mauritius but I only really went to Belmar. I think that's how you say it. Yeah. Whereas I got to see different areas of the island and mm. I got to meet the president, which is oh, crazy. this time around, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I got to meet the president of Mauritius. It's nice. <laughs> it's crazy to me because, I mean, that's like meeting Rishi Sunak. <laughs> like, you know, yes, it's you the mean. equivalent. Yeah. I'm, I was like, whoa, I'm just randomly with the president of Mauritius and I was in Miss World last week. What is happening right now? Mm. <laughs> so it was all a bit crazy. And then coming back home, honestly, for the first week, I just slept. I was so tired. Mm. And then after that, I was like, right, OK. I knew that the organisation were going to be in touch with me. With being a con- continental winner, I will now travel with the organisation this year to lots of different destinations. But they did say, it's going to be a few weeks. We're going to let you rest. And so first day after having a week off, I thought, right, I'm going to get back into my running because I love my running. Any viewers that were... For people who don't know, (laughs) just sign up for... You entered the ballot for the London Marathon next year. I have, so fingers crossed. We'll see. But on the first day I went running, I fell over and ended up having to go to hospital because I'd um, cut my hands and my knees open. And so that wrote me off for another week and a half I just Mm. had to stay at home and then in that time then Miss World got back in contact and said do you want to come to Dubai with us next week and I was like gosh guys okay I'll do it just for you I have better things to do (laughs) but sure I'll make her free my calendar for you guys (laughs) I know it's crazy yeah like it was a bit weird coming back to reality but it was definitely needed that rest period Mm. and then obviously now when I'm out with the girls there isn't that competition element there so and I'd never felt like I was in competition with anyone anyway. And I don't mean that in some kind of arrogant Mm -hmm. way. I mean, my only competition was myself because we're all giving our best. And how do you compare people's best? We're all different in so many different ways. How do you compare somebody that's using the platform to talk about STEM careers and empower women to somebody that's teaching children CPR or somebody that's providing electricity to rural areas? They're just completely different causes. Mm -hmm. So I never felt in competition whilst I was there. There, the competition for me I was thinking I need to look my best I need to mm. you know present myself like really well whereas this time round you know I'd landed you in the airport and I didn't have eyelashes on <laughs> you know what I mean things like that whereas back in Miss World I had eyelashes on every single day <laughs> I'm gonna push you there though <laughs> I think if you asked like if we were to ask both both men and women mm-hmm. as women would be told that we are sometimes judgmental and critical of each other mm-hmm. more than men are of each other mm-hmm. women sometimes Sometimes get the backlash of being in competition with each other, mm-hmm. bitching about other women, bringing them down, mm-hmm. while men are all like so casual about their friendships and maybe they wouldn't do it. Well, maybe casual about their friendship is not the right thing, but they're so casual about other men in general that they wouldn't. Mm-hmm. When, you're such, when you are in such a scene where it is very competitive, and I hear you that you manage to forge great friendships, mm-hmm. but it's still a very competitive environment. And I don't know if you can, if you are willing to say it or not, but do you feel like some people do have a facade on and you might question whether it's a genuine friendship or not or did you not feel that way at all hand on heart I didn't feel that way at all Mm -hmm. because a lot of the girls are very similar in terms of what they're they're wanting to use the platform to promote a cause essentially and also through the whole journey we've got to know each other on social media and so when you finally meet it's like you're already meeting friends you already knew Mm -hmm. and then obviously you get to know people even better so I was room in with Wales for the whole duration of it and then you're around certain girls for instance the Czech Republic who won I was next to her on stage because the way that they'd ordered us so I was next to her in all of the rehearsals she was in my group anyway Europe so sometimes I'd sit next to her on the bus and then also next to her on stage on the final night and we learned that we had things in common 
And then you just form a friendship based off that. There, there was nobody that I can pick out who I thought, oh, the vibes are off. Right. Not at all. Mm-hmm. Hand on heart. I'm not just saying that for the podcast. Sure. Genuinely got along with everybody. And I don't know, maybe it's because I went out my way and introduced myself to the girls. But I think you know that only one girl out of all of you can win. But you're also very aware that you're never going to get that moment again. Mm-hmm. When am I going to be surrounded by another 111 countries and be able to you know knock on the door and borrow this or you know see this girl or you know call them up for a chat like I've made lifelong friends so I really love that I love hearing it because I do feel like as women we're sometimes judged for our friendship yes we do have our friends and our best friends and then outside of that I feel like women we sometimes we sometimes thought that we are very critical of each other and it doesn't have to be Mm -hmm. I feel like people get it wrong sometimes over time it's all about supporting each other and like trying to uplift other women and Mm. I think as we get older as we age I there was this girl from uh, Bridgeton what's the actress name she went on a podcast that was called Brown Girls Do It Something of a Sort and she played Lady Edwina in Bridgeton season two mm-hmm. or something season two or season three anyway but then she's she's saying how sometimes the patriarchy does it such that women in the 20s have a very negative perception of women in the 30s mm. That is, we, there's been this form of perception that women in the 30s are miserable, they're unhappy, and that women in the 20s should go about their own way and shouldn't be taking advice from women in the 30s. And she was like, no, no, no. Like, I would actually take on the advice because they've lived longer than me, they've seen lives before me. And if there's anything that they're sharing of experiences, I'm all ears because I do not believe in the patriarchy. I do want to listen to what the older women are saying. And by that similar definition, as a woman in the 30s, you can say the same thing about women in the 40s and so Mm -hmm. on and I think it's very refreshing when you talk about the womanhood and like the female friendships that you've formed Mm -hmm. despite how competitive the whole thing has been for you Mm -hmm. because these are lifelong friendships and you both go back to your own country having your own culture representing your own countries and then coming back all together and still maybe sharing messages or how are you doing on whatsapp right yeah honestly like it's phenomenal I mean also there's a spectrum of ages at Miss World as well the youngest girl there was 16 wow I know she was from Bulgaria and she was near me on the stage as well because obviously Europe. I keep forgetting because in my head I'm like, you have to be 18 for this. No, so it's 16 up to uh, 27. But because the contest was slightly delayed, I'm 28. So mm. I actually wasn't the oldest in the contest, but I was one of the oldest. But even though you can see there's 12 years difference between me and Bulgaria. Wow. And even like Bangladesh, she was so gorgeous. She was quite young as well. I think maybe around about 20. Yeah. And she just had all of this energy and all of this passion and positive outlook and she was always cheering on other girls and I love that about her I really did Mm -hmm. and you're forming friendships which you know there's like a decade between you sometimes and you get along so well like age is but a number I know that sounds cliche (laughs) but yeah on the topic of you know what you've just said about girls in their 20s versus girls in their 30s like I can't wait to be in my 30s I know that sounds crazy I feel like when I'm in my 30s that's when my life will potentially become a bit more stable and I'll know what's going on and I'm excited for that. At the moment, I'm experiencing everything that comes my way. And I'm saying yes to every opportunity because I'm going to be working for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. So right now, whilst I've got the opportunity to travel with the most inspiring women around the world, I'm going to say yes to it because mm-hmm. everyone's days are numbered. I don't know when my last day is going to be. So I'm not going to say no to an opportunity like that because the people I'm going to meet and the places I'm going to go are going to shape me as a human. So when it comes to that job interview in the future or it comes to meeting that person, I've got things to relate back to and stories to talk about and I've met such a spectrum of people which will have shaped me and that's what I love about Miss World the big spectrum of girls who are there the ages and Mm. again yeah again women in the 20s 30s 40s 50s I mean there's so many people who are involved that you don't see behind the scenes and it's just incredible so yeah I don't I don't ever see it as a face of you know oh gosh I should fear women in their 30s Mm. I mean I'm nearly 30 myself (laughs) (laughs) I've never thought that at all I think you can be very much friends with women who are younger than you and women who are older than you you said you're excited to turn 30 yeah not other people would feel the same way I (laughs) think when I was turning 30 I've embraced it Mm -hmm. but there was that moment of oh there were things that I wish but more like there were things that I wish I had already achieved but Mm -hmm. I know it's not come about naturally so that's fine it's going to take time there was that moment where I feared it for like a few seconds like the midnight like we my sister and I we were a bit of like we have this thing of like just staying up for midnight I don't know why (laughs) but like there was those few moments where like oh like wow okay 
okay, that's like another, for some reason, it felt like a new chapter. Mm -hmm. And I know age is just a number, but for some reason, I don't know why, maybe it's the social construct around it, 30 has been made a thing. Mm -hmm. You don't sound like you're dreading it. No, not at all, because I think the reason why is possibly because I've done what I set out to do mostly in my 20s. Mm -hmm. Going through school, I never knew what I wanted to be, which is kind of evident being the model aerospace engineer. (laughs) But yeah, I never knew what I wanted to be, but I knew what I wanted to experience. And I knew I wanted to visit certain places. And so when I was 19, I toured the US on my own. I saved up all the money that I had from working in Asda and I came home with 20 pounds in the bank because I just always knew that I wanted to do that and I wanted to see it. And then I did the same with Southeast Asia and South America. And I'd gone after my dream in modeling and I thought, you know, this might not work out. It might not be a long run thing. Like I hadn't thought that far ahead. I was just thinking in the moment what I want to do right now. And I never had that big future plan. And it was only when I was in my early 20s when I thought, hmm, should probably go to university and have some kind of educational backup because Mm -hmm. I was looking at the most randomest jobs on the internet, just seeing what What they are. Mm -hmm. Everything required you to be a graduate. And I was like, oh my gosh, it doesn't matter how smart I may be when a test is put in front of me. I don't have that that degree certificate. Mm. And so obviously I ended up then going to university, like you know the story, but I'd set out to do what I wanted to do. Now don't get me wrong, I'm 28 now, I'll be 29 later this year and 30 next year. And in my head at this age, I thought... I would probably have, you know, a stable relationship and a partner, which I don't. You know, I would know where I was going to be living and based. I've got no idea what's going to happen. And that's all a consequence of my actions. You know, this past year, like touring the world and then I'm going to carry on doing so Mm. with the Miss World organisation. That is fantastic. Who gets to do that? I can't wait to do that. And so the other stuff will have to wait. But for the most part, I don't I don't dread 30 because I'm like, wow. All of the stuff I've experienced in my 20s, I can do the things I haven't done. I might manage to do it before I'm 30, I don't know. But I'm excited to know the future, if that makes sense. Like, to think, okay, am I working in... Am I working in engineering? Am I working in fintech? Am I doing this? Am I doing that? I don't know. But I'm excited to find out. And in time, it will all arrange itself, I'm sure. You fall back in place. Yeah. I love that perspective that you just shared because what I'm hearing here is that you've traveled, you've seen the world, you've mm-hmm. accomplished things and you, you were vulnerable for a moment where you did share that you don't have the partner, the stable relationship that you would have wanted at this age. Mm-hmm. And I think that's probably a very common theme right now with <laughs> women of, of our age, like late 20s and early 30s. And one of my friends quite recently shared this with me and she she only turned 30 this year and she she turned 30 this year but she shared that with me last year and mm-hmm. then she said imagine if one day you were say in three four years you've I think she was 29 so she was like imagine if at the age of 32 33 I then find someone were to tell me that I'm going to find the love of my life at 33 mm-hmm. and I'll be super happy with that person and this will be the father of my children I'll have the marriage of my dream everything that I wanted mm-hmm. how much more would I be enjoying life right now exactly that's so that's like so just, real just having the if someone were to tell me this would happen in the future at this mm. exact time exact year I would enjoy life so much more now like by going out with my friends, going to that restaurant alone, traveling the world and so on. Yeah. Why am I making myself so miserable over something that I don't even have control over? Exactly, exactly. And the thing is as well, I mean, comparison is the thief of joy. We all look at different people. Mm-hmm. And someone is looking at you whilst you're looking at somebody else. You know, you're fo- not really focusing on the things you have achieved and the things that you have or have done. You're looking at what you don't have. And that's that's never going to end. You know, there was a time when I used to think, oh gosh, nobody's going to want to go out with me because I've, I've not gone to university. And then after that it was, oh, nobody's going to want to go out with me because I'm a student. And then after that it was, oh, well, nobody's going to want to go out because with you, me. Because you're the finalist of Miss World and you might intimidate men. <laughs> <laughs> it literally... It never stops. It, it, it doesn't stop, no. And so I think it's just so important to just be present because we don't know how many days we have here. Mm. And don't get me wrong, like it's almost a bit hypocritical me talking talking about this because I would be lying if I said I don't like not panic but think about it Mm -hmm. but I mean just what I've done in the past decade some people wait a lifetime to do that and some people never even get the chance Mm. you know what I mean and I've still got so many opportunities in front of me as you say I might meet the love of my life when I'm 33 
I might have already met them. <laughs> you know, they might come back. I, I don't know. Back. I don't know. We've you... got stories to catch up after this. <laughs> <laughs> We have got stories to catch up on. But yeah, like, I am excited for the future and I'm learning to just, rather than thinking 25 steps ahead, focus on what I can control rather than what I can't. So for instance, like, I will panic thinking, oh my gosh, my lifelong career hasn't been set up yet and everything is changing and it gets overwhelming. And then I think, right, what can I actually focus on and do at the moment to battle that apply for a job that's it that's the most I can do right now mm. is just apply for a job if that's what I'm worried about if it's I'm worried about being in a relationship what is the most that I can do it's Put yourself out there and go on a days. dating app you know what I mean I've just got to focus on that very initial stage rather than the massive big spectrum of or the end goal because I mean even based off my own life things don't tend to go to plan <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I think I'm just trying to be more present <laughs> See, what you're doing there is something that I've learned quite recently from talking to people on the podcast. Mm-hmm. And two or three people have actually said it is changing your focus on the input and mm-hmm. not the output. So in your case, the output normally would be finding the partner, right? Mm-hmm. But you're actually making the input your focus. That is, I need to go on a date. Mm-hmm. That's the input. At least I've done that for myself. Mm -hmm. And then whether it works out or not with that person, I can't control that. But Mm -hmm. at least I've shifted my focus on that. Absolutely. And I also met someone recently, not in a romantic aspect. (laughs) My I add, it was literally just, I come across loads of people. Just in case she listens to this. (laughs) Originally, the conversation started off talking about engineering because this guy must have been maybe like, I don't know, 30 years older than me, 40 years older than me. And he'd studied engineering. So he was interested in me having studied engineering. And we were talking about different things. And one thing he said to me, which really stood out, was let your path to success be malleable that's going to change your life because we've all got this idea of how it should go Mm. but when you're open and something doesn't go to plan if you think in your head actually I'm going to be malleable here this hasn't gone the way that I wanted it to go but it doesn't mean I still can't achieve the end goal everything kind of feels okay and it really stuck with me not just because malleable is a very engineering word but It really kind of hit home. I thought, oh my gosh, you're so right. Like, if I rewind the clock and I tell 16-year-old Jess, you don't know what you want to be, but by the time you're 28, you're going to literally travel all over the world on your own. You're going to have represented your country in a huge contest. You've had Mm. massive modelling campaigns and you'll have got a degree in rocket science. I'd have been like, whoa, that sounds like I've got everything to look forward to. But there was times along the way when I've panicked because I think, oh, I don't know what's coming next. So I've learned from that and thought, okay, let's just be in the present. Of course, I've got ideas of where I want to go in terms of a career path, but just be present. Let's not focus on what I can't control. Mm. Let's focus on what I can. <laughs> and and and, let's, and if funnily, I'm sure, I don't know if it happens to you, but if you were to reflect on your current journey, mm-hmm. sometimes you don't take the time to be grateful for it. This is the things you probably knowingly or unknowingly you wish for when you were 16, 17. Exactly, yeah. You know, to be able to travel the world. Like, I think that's a lot of people's goal. They want to see things and mm-hmm. they want to experience things. And I've managed to do that so much by the age of 28. Like, I've been to 30-something countries, I can't remember (laughs) the actual number. And and yeah, some people wait a lifetime to do that. And I'm so grateful that I've been given, one, the opportunity, but also the health to be able to do that. Like, I'm so fortunate in that I have the ability to think, okay, yeah, I can board a plane and there's nothing restricting me. You know, that I have a strong passport. All of these things which we take for granted and you don't Mm -hmm. actually think about. You only realise these things, like, for instance, I broke my foot a few years ago, didn't really think about how much I used my feet until <laughs> until my foot was broken same the other week when I cut my hand open I didn't realize how much I used my hand mm. even just scrolling on my phone hurt me <laughs> so, so, so true yeah when I when I moved to London like moving to London was a dream like for, for me and my twin we both yeah. wanted to go to we both wanted to come to London for university it mm-hmm. was going to be London Paris or then probably like Australia but for some reason we have family here my brother's been here it just felt close well I say close it's far but mm-hmm. versus the US for my parents like London felt like this wasn't like a foreign place for mm-hmm. us to go and then these days where sometimes I'm like complaining about the weather I've been here for like 
12 years now mm -hmm. and sometimes for you know for not having everything for not having achieved everything I wanted and I mean like both maybe personally not so much professionally but more on the personal front mm -hmm. sometimes I'm like I just wish I could just leave London and start afresh somewhere else and then now that I'm listening to you I'm like it took me back to the time and I so I dreamt so earnestly of being in London and mm -hmm. I've really enjoyed London like L London feels like home mm -hmm. and then on the on days where I'm like not feeling great I'm like yeah like I just like London is not a great place to be mm -hmm. but this is the thing this is the thing I dream so earnestly of mm -hmm. and I think also when you have had the opportunity to travel it makes it harder to pick one place to settle mm -hmm. I always say that home is a person because or home is people because as I say I'm fortunate to have been everywhere and I would love to work out in North America working in the human mm -hmm. space flight industry whether that's America or Canada or wherever I'd love to be over that side to experience that for a bit but then on other days I'm like oh my gosh England in the sun is just elite <laughs> like I would love <laughs> not to, today not but. today but I would you know I'd love to live in London and because I know so many people here like sometimes I come here and I feel like I'm at home because I'm here that often but then other days I don't feel at home there I don't feel at home in Lancashire and I'm like where, where actually is home oh, that's so true and it's because I'm I've had the luxury to travel that I'm kind of like longing in to discover more places I'm like mm. oh how can I choose somewhere to just be when I haven't been everywhere yet and I'm never going to get over that literally I could travel to every country and I'll be like well I haven't been to the moon <laughs> <laughs> like that them stamp on <laughs> <laughs> that's where I'm at like how how can I pick but that's that's the beauty of it like we are lucky enough to not have to you can always come back to London you might think oh actually I want to work in San Francisco for a bit mm -hmm. and you could do that and then think okay I've been here for five years six years but actually I do fancy London again or oh, actually now I want to go back to Mauritius like you don't have to have your home as that kind of patch of grass home is mm. your people and where your people are and where you feel content, I think. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> kind of made me miss my mum and dad a little bit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> What's next after this, Jess? Next for me. So, as already mentioned... I feel like we need another podcast in a year's <laughs> time. We'll be like, OK, Jess, what did we say? <laughs> so, as already mentioned, so I'm going to be travelling a lot with the Miss World Organisation this year, visiting lots of the different charity projects around the world that the girls have created and mm -hmm. are supporting. So, I cannot wait for that. It's an experience that obviously I can't say no to. Mm -hmm. So I will be doing that. But at the same time, I'm still working on my STEM mission. So to get more girls interested in aerospace engineering and more kids into science and maths as a whole. So carrying on using my platforms as Miss United Kingdom, Miss World Europe, and just Jess to communicate that message. So connecting with media opportunities, doing things like this, podcasts and speaking at events. I'm going to be up in all of that, creating all of the content on Instagram, <laughs> which is getting people in to learn about planes and STEM yeah. and then also in time starting my own career now I can't say for certain what that's going to be in I, say, I should say my own career my own professional career I already okay. have a 14 year <laughs> long modeling sick. career <laughs> but yeah starting that as well I've got no idea what direction I'm going to go into because I'm working on different certificates which will make me employable in different places and in different industries but also my experience is so polar opposite to your typical aerospace engineering graduate it's opened up so many opportunities so I'm going to get to learn about these things mm -hmm. and then have a go at different things different industries and decide what I really like and where I want to be settled but honestly I've, I've got no idea like if somebody wants to ask me to be a TV presenter, presenting educational TV documentaries, I will be saying yes to that. You know that was <laughs> you know that was the one thing you did say to me last year. Yeah, like when I asked you, okay, what what are we talking about next? And you were like, you had finance yeah. on there, and then you talked about teaching. Yeah, and then you precisely talked about teaching kids. Yeah, I love that. I, I just honestly, I love being in a media setting because I'm very used to that through modelling to being in front of a camera, and I'd love to be able to utilise my knowledge in a way that I can make terminology understand to people who don't necessarily have a background mm -hmm. in that subject and inspire people and empower people and help them learn. I just I just love doing that. So if I could do that in a media setting with obviously my own TV programme, <laughs> that would be phenomenal. But for the time being, I'll be making my own versions, i.e. little reels on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, working towards my future career. So I've got all sorts on the horizon this year. I am going out to the US a few times as well for some space-themed yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make connections 
connections there. I mean, I was in the US last year and a professor from one of the very good engineering schools offered to fully fund a master's degree in aerospace engineering for me, which I was like, whoa, that sounds like an opportunity I can't mm-hmm. refuse. So I are need- you going to take it? Or are you thinking about it? Oh, gosh, I can't decide. I, I want to, don't get me wrong. But I also really want to dip my feet into industry. I'm yeah. like desperate to do that and get some experience because I can do that in time as well. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I just don't know. I'm going out to the US um, for another conference in the summer. And yeah, you just meet so many people who are offering you roles in different industries like oh you could work for us oh we would take you in a heartbeat oh Jess come here Jess do this Jess do that and I'm like well be everywhere (laughs) I'm fortunately not short of offers it's just the right time for it all so Mm -hmm. we'll see what happens that's amazing and for anyone who's listening to Jess for the first time we do have an episode we had last year's episode Mm -hmm. it's now on Spotify and Apple podcast where you talk about your STEM journey and how you went we talked about your high school education your degree yeah you had a very can I say unconventional path absolutely but brilliant <laughs> path so if anyone needs a bit of inspiration specific to their educational journey I think they should they should listen to that one no thank you <laughs> just last word having last maybe last question having been through the Miss World journey mm-hmm. having I feel like you were you were always such a confident person but I can sense like a different level of confidence <laughs> a year later what's the one thing you want to tell people in general oh gosh that's a hard thing to just say one thing I would say be present I know mm-hmm. I've already mentioned that but be present and focus on what you can control rather than what you can't because comparison really is the thief of joy and it's so easy to look at what you don't have and panic because you don't know how you're going to get it and it might be everything you want but you're thinking oh my gosh I might have to do this degree and then I might have to work in this position for a bit and then I might have to volunteer here for a bit but in the grand scheme of things you can look at that and think oh gosh that's going to take 10 years or you can think oh that's just three things you know focus on the first thing and then when you've got the first thing focus on the second thing because Mm. you might change your mind during that whole journey things might happen which might prevent you doing certain things you know you might end up having a baby (laughs) like you don't know so yeah that's my lesson to myself as well Just be more present and just focus on what you can control rather than what you can't. One step at a time. One step at a time. Great. (laughs) Jess, so refreshing and equally so excited to have caught up the past one year. Mm -hmm. We're going to get lunch and we're going to grab a bite after this. We've got so much to catch up on. (laughs) But for everyone else who's listened to us, thank you for tuning in and thank you for being here today, Jess. Oh, thanks for inviting me back. (laughs) Next year, we'll have another one. (laughs) 